right, hello. Um, I'm Benita Roswick. I'm on the Aquatics Committee for the North Dakota Envirothon, and I'm going to talk a little bit today about using uh, determining water quality by looking at the things that live there. And uh, that's one of the best way to, ways to look or to determine water quality is to see what's living there, because if there's stuff living there, um, it means it can support life. So um, on this picture, there's a lot going on, but basically it's a picture of a watershed and you can see that um, there's all kinds of activity going on, human activity, and our watersheds aren't just the water, um, the water within this land area, it's also all the human activities that might influence the, the, the near-term and the long-term effects of the uh, animals that live there. So this uh, this presentation is about aquatic macroinvertebrates. So the first thing we need to do is figure out what aquatic macroinvertebrate is. So um, aquatic is something that lives in or near water. Macro means something large enough to see with the naked eye. And an invertebrate is an animal without a bug, without a backbone. And those are the insects. So aquatic macroinvertebrates are big bugs that live in the water. And I've got a few examples over on the right side. So when we look at what lives in a water body to determine water quality, we call that a bioassessment. So, uh, um, and a bioassessment is determined really by the diversity of animals that live in a water body. Um, Again, if you have lots of different things living in a habitat, it usually means it's uh, it's very suitable for life. Each type of, when we're looking at macroinvertebrates, each type of macroinvertebrate has specific conditions that it needs to survive and thrive. Some macroinvertebrates need really clean water. Other macroinvertebrates can live in water that um, has low oxygen, um, kind of warm temperature, kind of stagnant water. So, um, and because of those differences, macroinvertebrates are, are really good at determining water quality. I included a link um, of a stream bioassessment, and um, I'm not going to show that now, but I'll share that link with Andrea and she can post it along with this video. So there's about seven reasons why aquatic macroinvertebrates are used in stream bioassessment. Uh, the first one is they're affected by the physical, chemical, and the biological conditions of the stream. They're small, uh, especially in their larval stage. They can escape pollution very easily. Um, they can show the cumulative impacts of pollution. And uh, the fourth one, they may show the impacts of habitat loss that wouldn't be detected by the chemical water quality tests, the dissolved oxygen measurement, the pH, the conductivity, those kinds of tests. Uh, fifth one, they're an essential part of the stream food, food web. So obviously if there's a link missing to the food chain, um, that's gonna show up in other places. Um, like I said earlier, some are very intolerant of pollution. Those. Uh, Aquatic macroinvertebrates need really clean water, so we can tell um, if they're there, we can kind of assume that, that the water is pretty clean. And the last one is they're pretty easy to sample and to identify. They don't take, it doesn't take a lot of equipment, and with some training, they're pretty easy to identify. So we're gonna go through the, the, pollution, uh, the pollution types, so we call that pollution tolerant. And the first ones we're going to talk about are the intolerant macroinvertebrates. These are the ones that need the really clean water. They're very sensitive to water pollution, um, oxygen amounts, and water temperature. And if you remember from the water chemistry video, uh, oxygen amounts are dependent on temperature. So the warmer water gets, the less capacity it has to hold oxygen. So those two kind of go hand in hand. Cooler water temperatures have uh, a greater ability to hold oxygen. So the intolerant or the sensitive bugs are good indicators of water quality, and they're only found in the streams that have good water quality. 
And when we look at these, I've got three bugs here, the, the mayflies, the stoneflies, and the caddisflies. And I've included their order name. So the, the mayflies are the ephemeroptera, the stoneflies are the plecoptera, and the caddisflies are the trichoptera. And that is a, those three uh, orders of insects make up the EPT index. It's an estimate of water quality by looking at the abundance of these three orders of stream insects that have low water tolerance. Um, one thing to note on the Envirothon test, if we ever ask you to identify uh, an invertebrate, one of these, for example, let's say we, uh, we have a sample of a mayfly and you're supposed to identify it. Um, and we'll talk a little bit a little later in the video about how to identify them. But when we ask you to identify them, don't just put the word mayfly. You could, we could have different, um, well, one, there's there's lots of different mayflies, but we always ask you to use the order. And um, that's because um, common names just, uh, there's a lot of common names for some of the same, um, for some of the same macroinvertebrates. So we always refer to them by their scientific name. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. Oh, wait, I'm going to go up. OK, the next one is the moderate tolerant macroinvertebrates. These are the ones that are somewhat sensitive to water quality conditions like dissolved ox oxygen, temperature, uh, and other things. And they're found in streams with fair and good water quality. Um, the examples of these are the Odonata, the dragonflies, the Megaloptera, which is the dragonflies, and the Amphipoda or are the scuds. And the third category is the tolerant. These are the macroinvertebrates that can withstand, can withstand very poor water conditions and also pollution. And they're found in streams with, uh, with both poor and good water quality. So that's the thing with these tolerant macroinvertebrates. They're found in all water types, not just the poor water quality types. Um, examples are the diptera, and that order has both the midges and the black flies and the leeches. And I'm not even going to attempt to uh, pronounce that order. But again, you don't have to know the orders. Those will be listed on the keys. So just so you know that. All right. So healthy stream ecosystems have many species of, of macroinvertebrates, including the tolerant ones. So we call this high biodiversity and high abundance. So lots of different kind of bugs uh, in high numbers. Polluted streams, however, have fewer species. They they'll only have the tolerant species. So they're very low in biodiversity. Um, next up is the identification, how we identify them. And scientists use something called a dichotomous key. And it consists of a series of statements with two choices that will uh, eventually lead you to the correct answer. Um, there's lots of uh, macroinvertebrate dichotomous keys out there. You can find one in the Streamkeepers Field Guide. That's this green book that I show, have the, the front cover on the left. I believe Tina has free copies of that guide, um, so you can Feel free to contact her if you haven't, if you don't have this book. Other links, um, I've included links of some of these other, uh, other of, a, of a dichotomous key, I'll say. And I'll give those links to Andrea as well. So on the next slide, we're going to look at a dichotomous key. So this is an example. I've included the link at the bottom. And so Question number one says, does it have segment, segmented legs or doesn't it? So we're going to say that it does have segmented legs. And it says, go to question number two. And question number two says, does it have six legs or more than six legs? So count the legs. Um, in my uh, fictional uh, macroinvertebrate, which I'm going to, I'm going to, in my mind, I'm thinking of the stonefly. So we'll say six legs. Does it have wings or uh, no wings or the wings aren't um, entirely developed? Uh, oh, 
or B is wings cover the entire body, but they don't have legs and it may be beetle-like. So uh, our stonefly doesn't have wings. So we'll go to number four. Uh, number four says, is the body longer than it is wide or is it oval and flat? And our stonefly is obviously longer than it is flat. And it says, go to number five. Number five says, uh, question number A, does it have two or three distinct hair-like tails that are not fleshy or hooked, but it may be fringed um, or not as above? So we're gonna say they do have, uh, stoneflies do have tails. So we're gonna go to question number six. Number six is two to three tails that are plate-like or hair-like along the sides of the abdomen. Or number two is, or B is two tails and may have gills under the thorax. All right, so um, with stoneflies, they almost, they, they have two tails, whereas the mayflies, they almost always have three tails with the exception of that one on the, on the left. Um, so you can see a stonefly larva is in the order Plecoptera. It's listed right there. So again, if you're identifying something, we're not asking you to memorize these orders. They're, they're, they will always be listed in the resource at, the, um, at your station. So just remember that. You can see the mayfly larva above that, order Ephemeroptera, okay? So just remember, you don't have to memorize these order names, but you do need to know how to use the dichotomous key and within that dichotomous key, you'll find the common name and the scientific name, but always write down the scientific name. And um, there have been questions where we've asked for family. So remember, so for example, look over here on the right side, there's the riffle beetle. That's in the order Coleoptera and the family Elmidae. So whatever we're asking for, I'm not gonna ask for anything that isn't already on the key. All right, so the key goes on and whatever you're looking for, you just continue to ask those questions, all right? Okay, so uh, on this next slide, you'll see we have a chart and um, this is a chart that we use to determine water quality in the stream by, you, by looking at the macroinvertebrates. So on the next slide, we're gonna, uh, we'll have a hypothetical um, sample. And um, so let's say you have a sample of aquatic macroinvertebrates. In this chart, it doesn't matter how many of any particular type of macroinvertebrate you find. We're just going to check the, whether they're present or absent. So in the first column, um, in our sample, we found caddisflies and mayflies. So we just put a check. Now, whether we found one mayfly or a hundred, we'll just put a check mark. Same with the other columns. Uh, the other column has the less sensitive. So we we had some net spinning caddisflies, some dragonflies, damselflies, and scuds. And we only from the tolerant species, we only had leeches. So once this chart is filled out, um, we count how many of these. Um, macro types of macroinvertebrates we found. So in the first column, the sensitive column, there were two types. So the number two times the number of checks, that's what that little, it kind of looks like a square root sign, but it's actually number of checks. And because it, these are the sensitive ones, they're multiplied by three. They're weighted a little higher on this chart. So we had two types times three is six. In the middle column, we had one, two, three, four different types of less sensitive macroinvertebrates. So four times two equals eight. And in the last column, we only had leeches. We only had one type. So one times one equals one. So you can see the first column, the sensitive are weighted by three. You multiply by three, the middle column by two, and the last column by one. So if we add up each of those, six plus, oops, gosh, six plus eight plus one equals 15. And so at the bottom, we look at the bottom chart and a score of 15 
means that the water quality is fair. It lies between 11 and 16. Okay. Um, next up, we're going to talk about fish um, a little bit. Um, all the information from here is coming from the resource, uh, an introduction to freshwater fishes as biological indicators. I've included the link. Um, this link is also listed on the resources on the, the list of aquatic resources. Um, don't freak out when you see this book. We're only gonna, um, we'll only test you on the information from pages three through 12. Um, uh, one of the things to, uh, to know is basic fish anatomy. Um, this is useful when um, using the, the dichotomous key for identification. So um, uh, figure one has different mouth in, uh, orientations orientations, um, inferior, subterminal, terminal, and superior. Figure two has uh, tail, uh, caudal fin. Caudal fin is also the tail fin shapes. Um, so just kind of look through that. Um, you'll need to know these body parts in order to uh, use a dichotomous key for identification. Here's a, um, I guess another picture, a little bigger picture that shows some of the uh, fish anatomy and parts. And um, I've listed, uh, uh, here's a list of how fish, how and why fish are used as biological indicators. Um, they're long lived, they, they occur almost everywhere in a, in a wide variety of habitats, they're extensively studied. Um, there's a huge diversity of fish of fish in North America, and they have a wide range of feeding habitat habits, reproductive traits, and tolerances to the environment. Um, number five, they're relatively easy to identify. And one thing about fish is they're relatively easy to identify down to the species level. If you remember back when I was talking about the aquatic macroinvertebrates, a lot of times we only go to order or family. Um, it takes some uh, a really trained eye to identify some of them down to their species level and even then that can that can be really difficult. So um, fish can be identified to a species level much easier. Number six, they're well known. Many fish species are pretty familiar to the public. And number seven is um, uh, toxicity. They can detect toxicity trends. Um, However, there are some uh, disadvantages. It takes a little more manpower and more expensive sampling equipment. Um, number two is they're migratory. <laughs> they can uh, they move more readily than the uh, uh, macroinvertebrate macroinvertebrates, um, especially the larval macroinvertebrates. They kind of stick to where they uh, where they hatched as eggs, and there can be set, uh, sampling bias, whether you're using electroshocking or seining, both of those have their biases and advantages. So um, within that resource, there are some terms. So I took these terms straight out of that um, um, out of that uh, manual that I mentioned at the beginning. Just terms to know. What is a biological indicator? What does it mean to have biological in integrity? What is an indicator organisms? What is ecological health? These are all some pretty basic terms, nothing too complicated. Uh, on the next slide is the, uh, the feeding groups, uh, the fish feeding groups. And like macroinvertebrates, they're also uh, a vital part of the food web. And uh, an imbalance in these feeding groups could indicate uh, decreased food, food supply, or the effect of pollutants. So just kind of know that a piscivore is a fish that feeds on other fish. Herbivore, herbivores, we all know that, feed on plants. Omnivores, insectivores, they feed only on insects. There's filter, filter feeders, invertebra, invertivores, and generalists. So just some terms about fish. Let's see. All right, so I guess that kind of sums up what we, uh, uh, what I have to talk about. Um, essentially a bioassessment, which if you remember from the beginning, a bioassessment means looking at what lives in the water body to determine water quality. 
In this slide, I've talked a lot about aquatic macroinvertebrates and a little bit about fish. Um, I think if you watch this video and look at the links that I've attached, you'll be very well prepared for, um, for this portion of the aquatics test. Um, if there's, if you have questions or need to know anything, reach out to Andrea. Andrea can uh, forward your question on to us. Thank you for watching.